So again, today, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about casting out unclean spirits, and we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 4, verses 31 through 44. And once again, I want to encourage you to take good notes, because we're going to touch on some some areas, some issues. And before I get started, I just want to say casting out devils is easy. <laughs> it's not complicated. It's not a problem for anybody. In fact, the Bible tells us that all authority and power has been given to whom? Messiah. So when we start off from that position and understand that the authority and power that he has been given he has given to us and then tell us that the things he did, the works he did, we, we are to do. These are the works that we are to do. And so it's important for us as believers to know who we are in him and then to walk in that authority and power without fear. I mean, you know, fear is not of him. He didn't give you fear. And so we certainly are, are not supposed to operate in fear, and we, we're certainly not supposed to be afraid of the devil. I remember back in the day, people used to uh, talk about being careful about what you say out loud. Folks used to teach us that, you know, the whole purpose of us being able to speak in tongues is so the devil couldn't understand what you were saying. Let me tell you, you need the devil to know what you're saying, especially when you're talking to him. <laughs> You don't need to be talking into some in, in, in some unknown language. I mean, I've seen people, you know, try to cast out devils speaking in tongues. Like, really? Okay. But I know that that is based on things that people have been taught. So what I want to do again here today is I'm going to, I'm going to try to make this as plain and as simple as I possibly can, so even your toddlers can, can get this. I mean, so casting out unclean spirits was not a common practice in Israel before Yeshua's ministry, nor is it a common practice today. Now, I do recognize that there are some people out there and there are some ministries out there that are engaged in casting out demons. They have what they call deliverance ministry. I learned long time ago that devils have to obey us, but when we're dealing with other people, they have to operate in the authority and power that they must in order for whatever spirit to be cast out of them, not to return to them. It's, it's, not, um, it's not my, my role to um, live the life of the person who has a spirit that is being cast out. It's their role to live their lives. And I'm saying this to say because Yeshua is going to reveal to us, as he has in the teachings in the word, that when, when spirits are driven out, they, they have to go, but what are they going to do? The day is going to come when they're going to come back. And, and before I even get into this teaching, it's most important for you to know that walking out your deliverance, walking out your healing, walking out the power and presence of the Almighty in your life is more important than having the spirit cast out of you. And you'll see as we go through this, this teaching today. One of the first miracles of Messiah's ministry was demonstrated by casting an unclean spirit from a man in a Capernaum synagogue. Unclean spirits are called by several names in the Old and New Testament. De devils, demons, and evil spirits. And they're all speaking of the same thing. So in some versions of the Bible, you'll hear, you'll see devils. In some, you'll see demons. And some you'll see evil spirits. And in this particular passage, we're going to see unclean spirits or unclean devils. Now, this is always interesting to me. What's the difference between a clean devil and an unclean devil? 
But this the, Luke makes it clear that he's talking about unclean devils, but what we're looking at is spirit. There are clean spirits and there are unclean spirits. <laughs> If we're gonna we're gonna hopefully help you uh, get an understanding of that. So they they are although unclean spirits are not mentioned by that name in the Old Testament, they existed in the land and nations that inhabited the future land of Israel and the surrounding nations. Jehovah gave specific instructions for his people concerning unclean things, unclean spirits, and what to do to avoid them. And what we're going to see in this teaching is we're going to examine this particular subject and then how to detect or recognize unclean spirits and what to do to cast out unclean spirits according to the instructions of the Messiah. So we're starting in chapter 4, verse 31. And Yeshua came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he taught them on the Sabbath days. And I pointed this out because it's important that Yeshua taught them on the Sabbath days, indicating it wasn't just one Sabbath day that he taught. It was his custom uh, to go into the synagogue. As we noted, once he came out of the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And let me say the difference between devil and devils is really one is Satan and the other is the messengers of Satan. That's what we commonly refer to as demons, unclean spirits, evil spirits, and the like. Verse 32 says, And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. Now, this should cause us to take note because when he came and he began to teach, the people were astonished at his doctrine. And my question is why? Why were they astonished? Why were they amazed at what Yeshua was teaching? Understand that the people in the Capernaum synagogue had been going to the Capernaum synagogue long before Messiah came. They had their rabbis, they had their teachers, and these individuals would teach and, and they would um, instruct the people. We know that they didn't have a New Testament. They had the Torah, they had the writings, they had the Psalms. But yet when Yeshua came, they were astonished at his teaching. Why? Because they were hearing things being taught they had not heard, and his words produced power. And this, this power was to correct their thinking. When you think about it, as we've gone through Matthew, as we've gone through John, we know that what the rabbis, the teachers, the teachers of the law were teaching were traditions. They were teaching the traditions of men, the traditions of the elders. They were teaching a form of doctrine that had been handed down from generation to generation. They claim all the way back to Moses. But we know that before Babylon, there were no such, such things as synagogues. In Babylon, synagogues were established. And during the Babylonian period, People were being instructed. Where were they being instructed? In the synagogue. When they came out of Babylon, they brought the synagogue system with them. But here's an interesting notation, if you would, that during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, which was the time of Babylon and the release from the Babylonian captivity, we learn that the Torah scroll had been taken and was put in the Babylonian treasury along with all the other vestiges or furniture that had been taken from the temple. When Cyrus released the people, 
When the people were released, they opened up the treasury of, of, the, of Babylon and gave them all of the things to bring back with them. So here's the question. If the Torah scroll <laughs> was in the treasury, what were they teaching? What were they teaching from? Now, what one would say is memory. Individuals had been taught there was memory, but the only ones who had access to the Torah scrolls were the priests, right? The people had to come up before they went into Babylon, and they were there for a period of time, which means that we saw a generation of people die, a new generation spring up, and what they were hearing from was what was being spoken to them by those who had established their religious system in Babylon. Understand the reason why they were in Babylon to begin with is because they weren't operating according to the instructions they had been given. They had been warned. <laughs> I got this, uh, this, this fellow who, you know, we have the Orkin people come to our, to our house on contract because we have bugs and, and, you know, we live in an area surrounded by woods and stuff like that, bees and, and, and those kinds of things. But whenever this gentleman comes to my house, he always want to engage in a conversation. And in this particular, um, this week, he, he was telling me how he was finishing up in the Chronicles. And one of the things that he said, which anyone who have read the Chronicles or the Kings, you'll know that there were a lot of wicked kings. There were good kings, but the, the wicked kings outnumbered the good kings by a wide margin. And the people were living under these forms of authority with the priestly system, but individuals usurping the systems of the priesthood, especially after the dividing of the kingdom after Solomon. And so prior to going into Babylon, you had all of these teachings that were being, you had, you had two places where people were going to worship, one in the southern kingdom, another in the northern. You had individuals with their high places, folks who were going up to worship, individuals who were causing their children to walk through the fire. But prior to the nation becoming a nation coming out of Egypt, Individuals for over 400 years were exposed to the type of ministry, God's idolatry that was being practiced in Egypt. In fact, shortly after the Almighty brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, they made a golden calf and began to sacrifice to it, saying these these, indicating there was more than one, but that these are the gods who brought us out of the land of bondage. Even though the Almighty had introduced himself to them and made it clear that he was the one who brought them out. Over the course of history, you'll see that people always engage. We can go all the way back to the first man, the first woman, who decided that they were not going to listen to the Almighty and allowed the devil, the serpent, to speak to them and cause them to, to, to doubt and ultimately to disobey the instructions that the Almighty has given. People today are doing the same kinds of things, having forms of godliness, rituals, religion, going through motions that are religious in nature. And what we're going to see that when Messiah came, 
teachings abounded. You had the temple systems with the Sadducees. You had the synagogue systems with this Pharisees, with this rabbis, with the scribes, with the teachers of the law, the lawyers. And we note that in the earlier chapter of Luke chapter 2, when Yeshua was 12 years old, his parents took him up to the temple. They left him. After three days, they found him. He was reasoning with the, the lawyers, with the experts in the law. At 12 years old, they're astonished at his teaching, astonished at his doctrine. Why would they be astonished at the teachings of a 12-year-old or the statements a 12-year-old is making, asking questions and responding to the questions that were asked of him? We see Luke lay out the history because he, he tells us a little bit about the father and the mother. And then he tells us about John, Zachariah, and Elizabeth, and how these were individuals who were righteous. They were holy, indicating that they were operating according to the commands, the instructions of the Almighty. This is the difference. Yeshua came and he taught them as one having authority and power. Now, when it comes down to the fact that they were astonished, one of the, <laughs> in looking at some of the way this word is used, <laughs> It's, it's to strike out, to expel by a blow, to drive out or away, to cast off. And, and the way this word is being used here is that while he was teaching, their thinking was being corrected. It was, it was causing them to, to hear what he's saying. They even went as far as to say, this man teaches different than the people that we've been accustomed to, to, to teaching us. There's something about what he's saying that has authority and power in it, which is very different than what we are accustomed to. And this is one of the things that astonished them. The power here. And this word power, power is going to be used a couple of times in both senses of the word of exousia and dunamis. One has to deal with the authority. And this is the authority that we are given. We're going to see in, in this teaching, I'm going to remind you of teachings that we've done before, where when Yeshua sent out the 12, remember in Matthew chapter 10, he sent out his 12 disciples. Right now, one of the 12 disciples was Judas. He gave them authority to do what? Drive out demons. The Holy Spirit doesn't come until much, much later. It is not until Acts chapter two that we see the Holy Spirit come upon all of the people who had been gathered. But prior to that, we see Yeshua breathing on a couple of his disciples, telling them to receive the Holy Spirit. But when those disciples, none spirit-filled disciples were sent out, he gave them authority to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out unclean spirits, to preach and to teach into the towns that he was going to come into. And they went forth and they were amazed that they came back saying, even the devil submits to us. Now this is, mind you, before being, being filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm pointing this out because as disciples who have been given authority, we have been given authority by the Almighty over the devil. This is not based on you being filled with the Holy Spirit, although being filled with the Holy Spirit, <laughs> it is a huge benefit and plus when it comes down to teaching. 
to instructing because this is the anointing that teaches us, that instructs us, that show us things to come. The spirits recognize that Yeshua, his teaching, were not the traditional teachings being taught in the day on the Sabbath days. Yeshua, and, and here's the thing that we must always remember because it's important for us to not try to get an image of the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Lamb of God. It's important that whenever we see him, we equate the word. We, 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 we can take Yeshua out, the name we can take out, and we put the word. Why? Because his name was called Yeshua, but he was the word made flesh. And you can get caught up in the name and ignore the word, thinking that the power is in the name. See, the power is not necessarily in the name. The power is in the word. So you can call him Yeshua, Yehoshua, Yahweh, Jesus, the Lord. That's not what the power is, brothers and sisters. The power is in the word. Because even when the man named Yeshua was taken into the wilderness, he didn't speak to the devil saying, devil, don't you know who I am? Don't you know what my name is? How dare you come to me? I'm the name. No. He dealt with the devil the same way you and I have to deal with him, and that's according to the word. And when we looked at that, we saw that the anointing and, and him dealing with the devil, every place he dealt with the devil was from Deuteronomy. It was straight from the Torah. We dealt with the fact last week and before that from Adam to Moses, Sin reign. Now we know the wages of sin is what? Death. But when Moses came, it wasn't the man Moses. It was the word spoken out of the mouth of Jehovah, given to Moses that he wrote down and came and instructed the people with. As we've said, Jehovah spoke, Moses wrote. There is no such thing biblically as a Mosaic law. That's theology. Moses didn't have laws. Moses received the word. He wrote down what he was instructed to write down. And he delivered that word to a freed people in order for them to remain free. And the only thing that caused them from remaining free is disobeying the word that had come from the mouth of Jehovah. Moses made it clear, Yeshua made it clear, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of Jehovah. That's what the devil is afraid of. See, he, he ain't afraid of you. But he, he know that word and he know them that know that word. See, those who don't know that word is, per, is perpetu, what is perpetrating. See, you can be a perpetrator or you can be authentic. Prior to Yeshua, you had a lot of perpetrators. They had been taught in their schools. They had been taught in their, in, their, in their schools, in their yeshivas. They had been taught by their rabbis, by their elders. But what Yeshua came with 
was what was written. Not you have heard it said by them of old, but I say. And what did he say? He said what he said. <laughs> he wasn't quoting the rabbis. He wasn't quoting the religious leaders. He wasn't quoting the elders. In fact, when he taught, he made a distinction between what they said, but I say unto you. Now, you didn't heard them teaching, but I say unto you. And this is what we want to get, what he said, because when he sends out his disciples, he says, listen, this teaching don't need to be altered. It, it, it don't need to be mingled. It don't need to be watered down. What I taught you teach. And so, Yeshua, the word made flesh, taught the word of Jehovah, not the traditions of men, nor the handed down traditions of the elders that were being taught in his day. Verse 33. And in the synagogue, there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil. And he cried out with a loud voice. Now, I don't, I don't think you have to be a, a road scholar to figure out that this probably wasn't that man's first visit to the synagogue. This person, more than likely, that was his home synagogue. That was the place that he frequented on the Sabbath day to hear the teachings of the day. This man, on this particular day, there was a man. When Yeshua came on that particular day, his presence stirred up them spirits. Now, it, it, it's important because it took, me, it took me a while. You know, before, before people start calling me reverend, which I don't, I don't respond to when folks call me reverend. I mean, I had an issue with that way back in, the, in my Baptist days. Um, it's, it's amazing how people um, can embrace non-biblical terms while rejecting the terms that is in their Bible. Now, you know, it's amazing that King James only people, let's just touch on them for just a moment. You know, there's not one place in the King James where a person is called reverend. And yet that is a, that is a term that people identify with. King James folks. More so than pastor, teacher, evangelist, prophet, apostle. Now, these are the titles that was given to the disciples. Evangelists, pastors, teachers, prophets, apostles. You'll find elders and deacons, but you won't find reverend. And so when people begin to refer to me as reverend, I would tell them, you know, I prefer not, you know, if, if anything called me, I'm, I'm ordained as an elder. You can call me an elder, you know, before I was a pastor or an evangelist, I didn't, I didn't acknowledge or recognize any of those names, but something about reverend just never really set right with me. And maybe I'm the strange duck because folks had no problem using it. I remember the first time I heard somebody refer to me as reverend, there was a, there was a, a spirit of pride. That's the only thing that I can, that I can call it. There was this spirit of pride that, you know, I kind of liked it. Why? Because, you know, that, that means that 
folks are recognizing me as one of the church leaders and acknowledging it by the term. And then I question why I felt that way. As something about titles, people, people can get big into titles, but see, your title don't make you. That's, that's not who you are. <laughs> see, anyway, this spirit, this unclean devil cried out. Now, the spirit is simply pneuma. That's, you know, the only difference between a, a spirit that is the spirit of Jehovah and unclean spirits is there's the spirit of Jehovah. Jehovah and the spirit that is not of Jehovah. Now, we call them sometimes fallen angels, um, whatever people call them. Th these spirits, although they were created by him, has now rebelled against him and is operating on their own under their master, Satan. Unclean is that which is not clean. Now, it's interesting, too, that you don't find much about uncleanness in the New Testament. It's dealt with in the Old Testament. And those of you who have been going with us through Leviticus as we've been going, we've been dealing with a lot concerning uncleanness and unclean spirit. Not unclean spirit, but uncleanness. And as we pointed out Paul's teaching concerning touch not the unclean thing, the average person don't have a clue as to what that is. Because the average person who have been taught in our societies today is all you got to do is pray on whatever was called unclean. There were things that were called unclean, that were detestable, that were abominable, that people were not supposed to eat. But in modern day, all you got to do is pray over it and you turn that which was unclean declared by him into something clean and edible. This is the twisting and the perversion of the word which would be classified as doctrines of devils. Doctrines of demons that you can now render what is unclean clean by a mystical prayer. That the power of your prayer can render what he considered unclean into something clean. And it's amazing to me that people who have such authority and power in prayer to render the unclean to something clean that now they can put in their temple... Don't have the faith to lay hands on the sick or to cast out a devil. Now, they can turn something clean that was unclean, but can't command something unclean to leave. See, doctrines of demons manifest themselves in a variety of ways, oftentimes unbeknownst to the individual. But the way you recognize a doctrine of demon is find out, is that scriptural? Is it scriptural or is somebody tried to take a scripture or a passage and manipulate it to, to mean what they've been taught? It's interesting that with all the clean things that people can eat, why would somebody gravitate to that which is unclean? Some of you remember I told you about my uh, time in Russia. I was at these, this minister's home with a bunch of other ministers, and the word had been communicated that we don't eat um, unclean things. And they went out of their way. They provided, you know, lamb, <laughs> beef, fish, and then they had their own 
pork dish. And once they made sure we were all taken care of, you know, the host asked if it would be offensive for them to eat the pork. And it's like, this is your house. Now, with all this clean food, why would you want to eat something unclean? This, this doesn't make sense to me that you now have to bring this in when you got all this. And it was then that I realized that eating pork was the mark of a rebellious church. The freedom to eat unclean is the distinguishing mark of an individual said we can do whatever we want to do because God by his grace has given us freedom. And it was at that moment that I recognized what I was working with and what I'm dealing with even to today. Choices that people make while reading Paul's teaching, touch not the unclean thing. See, according to that doctrine, there's nothing unclean anymore. What is unclean? Well, now, you know, the focus becomes homosexuality, abortion, and those kinds of things, which are detestable practices. And then try to make abortion as sacrificing your, making your children walk through the fire. It's like, you know, there's a lot of twisting and manipulating of scripture to justify particular positions. Abortion is murder. It's killing the unborn, period. Call it what it is. If it's murder, it's a crime. If it's a crime, prosecute the criminals. Stop trying to tiptoe around it. Either it's a crime or it's not a crime. That's black and white. Well, now, wait a minute, brother. <laughs> now, you wait a minute, because now you're going to start twisting and manipulating to try to get me to come. Listen, if, if, if it's wrong, if it's murder, call it that. If killing an unborn child is murder and killing a born person is murder and you send the one who killed a born person to prison because you call it murder, then why not send the one who killed the unborn, which you call murder, to prison? That's logic. <laughs> But no, there's the twisting and the manipulation that goes on to justify one's actions and behavior. The devil here, unclean devils. Now, Yeshua was dealing with the devil himself, Diablo in the Greek, when he was taken into the wilderness. This particular devil is not Diablo. This is a evil spirit, a spirit, not Satan, the devil, but one of his cohorts saying, let us alone. Now notice the language here. What have we to do with thee, thou Yeshua of Nazareth, art thou come to destroy us? And then I, I know thee who thou art. I recognize you. There are languages that we have been taught that in essence it demeans us as sons and daughters of the Most High. You see, when the Almighty calls us to be holy like he is holy, then we would be recognized as his sons and daughters because we represent him. When religion tells us that or, or, or move holiness into some descriptive language, see, 
the description of holiness according to the Bible is operating it according to the word. God and his word is one. If I'm going to live holy and be holy, then my life is going to be reflective of his word. Why? Because his word is holy. I'm to hide his word in my heart. It is to transform me into being his ambassador, his messenger, his representative, his son, his daughter. I'm now being recreated in the image because at the fall, in the beginning, man was created in the image of the almighty. When man fell, man became in the image of its master, Satan. Man fell and he became now alienated from the most high. Father already put in motion the reconciliation restoration process, which will materialize in Messiah. So Messiah comes to be the representative, the example of human behavior in the earth. Prior to that, it was the fallen man under the tutorship, if you would, under the leadership, under the dominion, under the authority of the prince of the power of the air, the prince of this world. When Satan usurped authority in the garden, all who came afterwards was now his seed. This is why Yeshua says, we know your daddy is, your daddy is the devil. Why? Because if you were Abraham's seed, you wouldn't be acting and behaving the way you are. Now, here it is. The devil's seed is saying to Yeshua, you are the devil and you got a devil. That's amazing how the devil will call the righteous one the devil. This is what those who are not under the law call those who are under the law cursed. It's amazing how cursed people can call holy people cursed. Now, the question is, do you believe that? See, the whole purpose of the enemy is to call you out of your name. Let me tell you something. <laughs> Don't be afraid to be under the law. Why? Because from Adam to the law, sin reigned. The law stopped sin in his tracks. How? By identifying it. By calling it what it is. See, adultery wasn't adultery until Jehovah says, that's adultery. Now, you may say, well, it was adultery before he said it was adultery. But it hadn't been identified for what it is until Moses. Now he says, you shall not commit adultery. They were committing adultery before. Well, let me take that back. They weren't committing adultery before Moses. They weren't committing incest before Moses. They weren't lying and stealing and cheating and doing all that sinful stuff. Although they were sinning, but sin had not been acknowledged and therefore could not be dealt with for what it was until the Almighty labeled it. Once he labeled it, it's like, okay, can't do that no more. <laughs> Can't do that no more. Not unless I want to be at odds with the laborer, the labeler. <laughs> you see. So now that he says, this is not how you as a holy person is to conduct yourself. Then if I'm going to declare and embrace the holiness that I'm called to, then the thing that is not holy, that which is unholy, that which is unclean, that which he's identified as sin I'm not to, I'm not, I'm not to abstain. Cause see, if I don't abstain, I become unclean. If I become unclean, I open myself up to the unclean, the unclean spirits. If the enemy can get me to rebel against the most high who have saved me, who have delivered me, who have given me the power, the, the authority and power to live whole. If I rebel against his word, then now, just like Mr. and Mrs. Adam, I come back under the rebellious one. If, if I violate his law, I become lawless. 
Now the lawless one who he sent Yeshua to deliver me from has now recaptured me. And he didn't recapture me because he took me hostage. He enticed me to rebel. He enticed me to disobey. He enticed me. He said, that ain't sin. God knows that. It, he, he, just, he, don't, he just don't want you to have fun. He don't want you to enjoy yourself. Because he know if you, if you got freedom to do whatever you want to do, you become like him. Because you're free. <laughs> and who can tell a free man what to do? Nobody. Not even. And this is why every man is going to have to give an account. Every knee is going to bow. <clears throat> Although there were more than one spirit inhabiting the man in the synagogue, they spoke in a singular voice. The spirits or devils were afraid of Yeshua and recognized his authority and power. In verse 35, and Yeshua rebuked him, saying, hold thy peace and come out of him. So who is he talking to? He rebuked him, not the man. He rebuked the spirit. And told the spirit to come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the mist, he came out of him and hurt him not. So now it's like, okay, the devil has to listen. He responds. He comes out of the man. He can't do harm to him. He says, first of all, hold your peace. Hold your peace is another way of saying do no harm to him. Come out of him is saying you must come out of him. Now, the word here, meaning to honor, he rebuked him. So now he has to listen. He has to obey because he charged him. He says, you come out. Well, what is he going to do? Not obey? Now, this is, this is before the cross, folks. Why? Because when Yeshua was filled with the Holy Spirit and anointed, when he was anointed, but even before he was filled with the Holy Spirit and anointed, he was dealing with individuals that were of a particular mindset. And here's where it really gets down to the enemy, authority and power, operates in the mind of the man. What you give yourself over to, what you yield to. Now, we don't know how the man got an unclean spirit. But we know that before unclean spirits and devils were allowed to operate in the earth, man had the simple instructions of Jehovah. When we operate in obedience to Jehovah, as some in history did, then the enemy had no authority and power over them. That's walking in the word. When you walk in the word, see, I can tell you, brothers and sisters, you can have the Holy Ghost and still mess up. The Holy Ghost don't perfect you. The Holy Spirit will, but you have to yield. You have to listen and obey. You have to shema. The Holy Spirit will lead you if you let him because you can resist him. The Holy Spirit can instruct you if you let him because you can grieve him. <laughs> the Holy Spirit doesn't force you or I to do anything. Devilish activity and idolatry goes all the way back to the garden with the first man and woman who listened to the serpent and gave place to the devil and Satan. There is the devil called by several titles as we looked at last week and before the great dragon, Revelation 12, 9, was cast out, called that old serpent, called the devil and Satan. And what does he do? He deceives the whole world. 
he deceives the whole world. Now, what did James says? If you are a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word, you deceive yourself. What word? Because when James wrote it, there was only one word, and that was the Tanakh. He called it the, the perfect law of liberty. Why the perfect law of liberty? Because it was given to a freed people to remain free. The Almighty didn't give the Torah, the law, to the children of Israel in Egypt. He delivered them first. He brought them out of captivity, brought them out of bondage, destroyed or dealt severely with the nation that had them in bondage and said, now, if you obey these commands, you'll be exalted above all the nations, all the nations. There will be no more bondage for you. You'll be blessed in the city, blessed in the field. Whatever you put your hands to will be blessed. All you got to do is diligently hearken to these commands that I'm giving you today. And all of these blessings will come upon you. The opposite is true if you don't obey. And this is the thing that I couldn't understand in my Baptist church, in my Pentecostal church, in my charismatic church, in my Lutheran, in my Reformed church is that you want the blessings without the obedience. How does that happen? Is there a way now in Jesus Christ, because I put faith in him and by grace, I have access to all the blessings that you say without having to obey the commands that is required to receive the blessings? Because Deuteronomy 15 and on tells me that if I don't, hearken diligently to then all of these curses. So where does the curses come from? The curses come from disobeying the commands. The blessings come from obeying the commands. So how can you call me cursed if I'm trying to obey the law? Something's twisted there. Can we perfectly obey the law? We can work at it. Now, here's one of those times where you can apply the teachings of Yeshua. I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. So if you can do all things in him, then you can, you can obey the law in him, right? Or is that something you can't do? We just go expose the devil for what he is. Stop two timing the Almighty. There are devils that are messengers, also called demons, mentioned in this passage as unclean. The word unclean is used to distinguish the spirits from one another. Evil spirits are messengers of Satan, angels are messengers of Satan or messengers of Jehovah. This is why some people call them fallen angels. You think a fallen angel is a messenger of Jehovah, but it's still called an angel, right? It's not a messenger of Jehovah. <laughs> Much of what we know about angels and demons are based on works pieced together by weaving verses and passages of the Bible to develop teachings about angels and demons. These works theologically are called angelology, the study of angels, demonology, the study of demons. And now you got people who are telling you the different names of demons. And it's like, okay, where do you find those names of demons? Where do you find them? We know Gabriel, we know Michael. But where are you getting these other demon names from? From somebody who studied demonology. And where did they do their study? Now you got, you got, you got <laughs> a whole, you got a plethora. All I got to do is go on the internet. And you'll find all these different names of demons. Okay. <laughs> and, 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 and where did you get that knowledge from? Where did you get that information from? Whose books did you read? It kind of tell you where they've been. So you're going to learn from Satan on how to cast him out.
I see that in, uh, you know, that, that, is that the way you sure did it? Okay, enough. Some of y'all looking at me like, okay, bro, you're messing with my theology now. Good. The most important thing is a follower of Yeshua. Now, I should have put this in all caps. The most important thing as a follower of Yeshua to know about demonology is that as a follower of Yeshua, we have been given authority and power over Satan and demons or devils. That's the most important thing you need to know. Do you need to know the name of the demon to cast the demon out? The people were familiar with unclean spirits, but apparently were unable to deal with them or did not engage with them because this spirit now is crying out since Yeshua showed up. Verse 36, and they were all amazed and spake among themselves saying, what a word is this? For with authority and power, he commanded the unclean spirits and they come out. So they recognize the unclean spirits. And I'm sure that, you know, I, I, I suspect that from time to time, the unclean spirit may have acted up. Folks that don't engage it. You know how we deal with behaviors. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to engage it because it just might go off. And this is, this is how you have to, you have to distinguish an unclean spirit from carnal behavior. Because there's carnal behavior that will mask itself as an unclean spirit. When you're trying to cast out a demon when it's the flesh, it's somebody operating in the flesh. The way you deal with the flesh is you instruct it. And then you discipline it. You correct it. Behavior can be corrected. What may look like a demon could be the behavior of an individual who have identified how to possibly get what they want by certain types of behavior. Now, it it may take a switch, may take a belt. I don't know what it's going to take, but if that switch or that belt don't modify that behavior, and here's, it's like, okay, so if the switch and the belt is a threat to the demon, to where now it's just going to start behaving. That's not, way, that's not how demons operate, folks. <laughs> so they said, for with authority and power, he commanded the unclean spirits and they come out. And again, that authority there is exousia, power of choice, liberty of doing as one pleases. Its usage is power, authority, right, liberty, jurisdiction, It's like they say this man has authority and he's speaking to these unclean spirits as one with authority and with power. That word power there is dunamis. Now, here we saw before it was exousia, but here it's rendered dunamis. The earlier word power, remember? And this deals with usage, power, mighty work. Mighty work, Yeshua says, many mighty works will you do and greater. There are works that happens because of the dunamis, the, the, the power, the, the manifested power of the almighty. Yeshua says you receive when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. This is, this is supernatural power to operate in. We have authority simply by obeying the word and walking in the word. And then we've got the power to operate in the manifested power of the Most High. Now, there's a conflict when you don't operate in the Word, but try to manifest the power. There's a conflict within you. Now, you can operate in the authority power and command a spirit but then that spirit might jump on you 
Why? Because you're not under authority. In order to walk in the authority and power, you have to first be under authority. This is the, this is the main theme of the centurion who Yeshua says, you know, let me, no, you don't have to come to my house. Just speak the word. Why? Because I'm a man under authority. I understand how authority works. See, mom, dad, hmm, I'm going to step out into some danger zone, but time to time you have to do that. A wife who doesn't understand the authority of her husband will not understand the authority she has over her children. To try to exercise authority of your children without being subjected to the authority of your husband creates a problem for you. You don't have to obey your husband. You really don't. That's your choice. But don't be looking all stupid and foolified when your children don't obey you. Now, when a father deals with a child, mama, get out the way because it's for your own good. When a father takes authority in his home and operate in that authority, that child will recognize that authority. But what the child will try to do is separate the mama from the daddy, come in between the two and cause there to be discord between the two so that they can manipulate and control the mama. And once they are able to effectively control the mama, they can pit the mama against the father and control the house. Now you got children running your house. See, before the authority of the father can be usurped, he must first be bound. See, the child can't bind the father like the mama can. Because the, the, the father loved the mama. <laughs> and if she don't understand her authority, she will manipulate that authority and create problems for the both of them. And I would say to a wife, now, the moment you start standing with that child against your husband, just imagine you and that child living in your house Together. Just you and that child. Without the husband. If you can't stand that idea. Then you better get in your place. Because you can, you can manipulate that husband and say, put your hands on me. I'll call the police. That's the same stuff your child be said. Put your hands on me, I'll call the police. Right? Uh-huh. Got you bound up. Cause you don't want to go to jail. Come get me. <laughs> now you don't suppose to put your hand on your wife. And 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 you have to find ways to discipline your children. But I'm saying this to say, wives, know and understand your place. Because the moment the authority of the Almighty has been usurped. The devil knows no bounds. He doesn't respect authority that has been usurped. He only respect, recognize authority. Fathers, husbands, don't allow your authority to be usurped. Don't surrender your authority to your wife because you love her. If you love her, you'll correct her. Well, she's not your child. Well, the word is the corrective force. So if you're operating outside the word, husband, give her the word if you got it. See, many of them don't have it because the wife has more word than the husband do in many cases. I don't know how I got off on this, but I'm out there now. Husband, you need to learn the word. You need to stand on the word. You need to walk in the word. Because when you love the word, stand on the word, and walk in the word, you know what? Father, it's got your back. He will make your enemies 
at peace. So when Yeshua says a man's enemies will be those of his own house, if you got enemies in your house, brothers and sisters, start walking in the word. Because what, what will he do? He'll make your enemies at peace with you. See, they can argue with you and your philosophy, but just like the devil, you can't argue with the word. Truth will set you free. Brother, you just manipulating the scripture. See, that's your manipulative mind at work. I'm giving you some, some, some truth. So, I'm so far from the end. <sighs> he commanded. He charged them. Luke 4, 37. And the fame of him went out into every place of the country round about. And he rose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. And Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever. And they besought him for her. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever. And it left her. And immediately she rose and ministered unto him or them. Excuse me. Now notice this. Yeshua rebuked. The fever just as he had rebuked the unclean spirits. What's the difference? He rebuked the fever. But early he rebuked the unclean spirits. What's the difference? He was operating in authority. These signs shall follow them that believe. See, the question you have to ask yourself is, do you know your authority? Where do you get your authority from? Who gave you authority? Who gave you authority? The governor? The mayor? The, your wife's father? See, your wife's father didn't give you authority. He gave you his daughter. Once she becomes your wife, his authority is no longer valid. Now you have to walk in the authority you've been given. Where did your authority come from? See, only the one who gave you the authority can threaten you to take it away. If he gave it to you, only he can take it. If it came from someone else, they can take it from you. You got to recognize where your authority come from. And once you know that, you have to have the confidence to walk in the authority that you've been given. L let me throw this at you because this is, this is key to authority. The key to divine authority is divine humility. The authority that he's given you cannot be operated in pride. He resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. No matter how much authority you have been given, you better understand that the key to your authority is operating in humility. Not to become a tyrant or abuser, but one who is submitted, which James is going to tell us that the true authority, first of all, if you want to deal with the devil, you got to first do what? Submit. You submit to the almighty, resist the devil, and what is his job? He has to go. But if you operate in anything other than humility, why? Because pride belongs to him. Who? The devil. And if you operating in pride, guess what? You operating in his spirit. And he don't have to listen to you. In fact, he's now over. <laughs> ah, verse 40. Now, when the sun was setting, all they that had sick with diverse disease brought them unto him, and he laid his hands on every one of them, and he did what? He healed them. 
And devils also came out of many, crying out, saying, Thou art Messiah, the Son of God. It's like they mad. Devils also came out of many, crying out. It's like, man, we was cool till you, till you came. I used to, I used to, you know, when I was, before I was called reverend, You walk in the you walk in the in the house and people drinking beer and smoking weed and doing whatever they do. They didn't stop. Cause you walked in. But I remember after, you know, giving my heart to the Almighty, walking in his calling. Now I show up at that same house. People want to put stuff away. What's the difference? Now, at first, I used to be bothered by that because I didn't understand it. These people would say, well, we're just trying to show you some respect. Also, before, I didn't warrant it. You saw me like you saw yourself. Now you see it a little different. What changed? When you begin to walk in the authority and power, guess what? When you show up, the demons, the spirits operating in people recognize it. See, if your child is cutting up in school and you show up at school, guess what? They straighten up all of a sudden. If they're cutting up in the neighborhood and you walk around that corner and they see you, what happens? Now, they're cutting up in, other, in, in front of other adults, just cutting up, showing, showing they, you know, their nastiness, cussing, calling people out their name, threatening folks. And then mom shows up or daddy show up. Now, if mom and dad is like the child, then it just emboldened the child even more because they see backup. But if mom and dad is righteous and holy, they're going to take on a whole different demeanor because they know mom and dad don't play this. <laughs> Matthew 10, and I'm, 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 headed toward, I'm headed toward the end. Philip and Bartholomew, now Yeshua calls his disciples together. Here's what he said. Yeshua, well, Yeshua gave his disciples authority over demons, devils, unclean spirits to cast them out before they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Matthew 10, 1. And when he had called on, unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power. That's authority against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. So what did he do? He, he gave them power against unclean spirits to do what? To cast them out. Now here's a question. Had they been filled with the Holy Spirit at this time? You know, when I first started seeing this, for the first time, it's like, wow. Now, I've read this I don't know how many times. I've been in church, and they read over it, and, and it's like, how can they have this power over unclean spirits to cast them out? How can they be healing people of all manner of diseases without the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Because they've been given authority by the Messiah. You and I have been given that authority. As followers of Messiah, you have the authority over the works of the devil, whether you spirit-filled or not. <coughs> now, I know that doesn't sound good for some folks, but if you understood your authority and your power, then you would walk in that authority and that power 
just like the disciples walked in it because when they were sent by Yeshua, it's like, you know, we're the disciples of Messiah. We're coming because he sent us. He said we got authority. He said we got power and we're going to operate in that power and operate in that authority. And the devils we're going to see recognized it. Question is, is whose authority are you operating in? That's the issue. He names them. Notice the notice. Simon, who's called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus, Lebaeus, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. So here it is. He's casting out demons. These 12 Yeshua sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles or into any of the city of Samaritans, enter you not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Is that in your Bible? So it's not just in my Bible. It's in your Bible too. Now the question is, do you believe it? Because if you can believe it, then put your name in there. Now you're going to see where the struggle comes. <laughs> the struggle ain't in here. The struggle is up here. That's where you're going to be battling with what is written. You sure didn't have those struggles. Why? Because he was the word. He lived it. He demonstrated it. He operated in it. And that's what you and I have to do, brothers and sisters. And we got the bonus. We got the first fruit of the spirit. We've got the Holy Spirit that empower us, that strengthens us, that encourages us that lead us and guide us and show us things to come, that teaches us. And then later he said, he that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth. We'll get to that in Luke 11. When the unclean spirit is going out of a man, and here's what you have to remember, he walketh through dry places seeking rest. And finding none, he says, I will return unto my house once I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. And that was a, that's something that is hard to, 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 to grasp. What does it mean he sw if the house is swept and garnished? I'll tell you what I believe it means. The house is clean and filled with grace. Now, grace may be sufficient for you. <laughs> but you, you cast out demons by authority. And by power. And if you sin or violate his commands, then the enemy that you try to cast out can actually influence you to the, to the degree to where now you find yourself sliding backwards. And once you start sliding backwards, now the enemy is going to do he, he coming, he's coming for the mind now. Why? Because guilt, condemnation, shame, all the stuff that comes to a person who know better but don't do better. To know what they're supposed to do but don't do what they're supposed to do. See, it ain't the devil beating you up. It's you beating you up. You beat you up more than the devil. The devil doesn't really have authority to do it. And why would he if you're doing it to yourself? He got other things to do <laughs> than to be messing with you. Now, I don't need to mess with them. They, 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 they all right all by themselves. Why? Because they're condemned, self-condemnation. They're shamed because they knew better. They're beating themselves up. They're punishing themselves because of their behavior. And they don't really understand this grace that they say they got. Because if they understood grace, they wouldn't be under that condemnation. 
they would repent, get things right, and move forward. So now this spirit sees it swept. He sees it garnished, unlawed, untorified. <laughs> no word. It's just clean. He goes and takes to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is what? Worse than the first. I don't know if you've ever seen somebody who was clean, who was healed, who were delivered. And find themselves under, under those circumstances and in some cases worse. Seeking out such that practice or had familiar spirits was forbidden. Forbidden and cause people to be defiled by them, rendering them unclean. I'm going to give you a few more passages of scripture. I'm going to read some more and then I'll be done. Regard not, Leviticus 19.31. Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after withers to be defiled. That means to become unclean by them. I am Jehovah your Elohim. Jehovah's plan for his people was the ministry of the prophets that inquired of him on behalf of his people, whereas the nations around them sought supernatural information and directions from other sources such as. And here's where he, he speaks to them in Deuteronomy. Okay. I don't know why. Okay, part of, part of Deuteronomy is not mentioned here. So g give me a moment, if you would, because the rest of this is not going to make sense. Because he's telling them that they are to, um, they are to be, be perfect. They're not to give themselves over. That should start at verse number nine. I need to pull it up here. It's Deuteronomy 18. And I believe it's around verse number nine. Oh, yeah. It says, when you are called or when, when you are come into the land which Jehovah Elohim giveth thee, you shall not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire or to use divination. And one of the things that I want to encourage you, if you don't have a concordance, then... Um, some of you are familiar with the blue letter Bible. If you have a concordance, go look up these words. Look them up. Because th the bottom line is that the children of Israel is being brought out of the land of Egypt for all kinds of sorcery and diviners. You remember when, when Moses came in and he began to perform the works of the Almighty that he was instructed and the Pharaoh called his sorcerers and, and his spiritualists and all them individuals and they tried to mimic what Moses was doing. See, the people were familiar with idolatry before he brought them into the land. And he's warning them, he says, listen, I'm bringing you into a, a land, I'm gonna displace and remove some people, you're gonna be free, I'm gonna exalt you above the nation, this land is gonna be a blessed land. Now, here's the thing. When I bring you into that land, take your eyes off the people around you. He says, don't, don't be like them. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire or that use divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, 
or a necromancer? For all that do these things are an abomination unto Jehovah, and because of these abominations, Jehovah your Elohim doth drive them out from before you. So what is he saying? The people that are in the land do this stuff. Now I've allowed them to inhabit the land until I was ready to bring you out of Egypt and into the land that I swore Abraham. Now, when you come into the land, it's going to be important that you drive out all of the inhabitants of the land. Don't cohabitate with them. Don't enjoin them. Don't look at how they worship. Don't look at their high places. Don't let your sons intermingle with their daughters. Don't let your daughters intermingle with their sons. Don't let them marry. And don't worship me like they worship their gods. It's an abomination. Now, he's saying, with that, here's how I'm going to deal with you. I know you seek instructions. I know you seek knowledge. I know you desire understanding. I know you want to know what your future is. I know you want to, you want to be shown things that are to come. For that reason, I'm giving you my word, and I'm giving you my prophet. I'm giving you my word. I'm giving you my prophet. Now, Moses was the prophet Jehovah spoke to face to face. I know in churches people talk about, you know, touch not my anointing, my anointed and do my prophets no harm. Listen, he's talking about Moses the prophet and who was the anointed? Israel. Who's the anointed today? The people who join themselves, the family, the household of Jehovah. We are his anointed ones. Just as Yeshua said last week, you know, he has anointed me and he was the anointed one. We too are his anointed. We've been given an anointing. His anointing does, it teaches us. It, it instructs us. It, it, it shows us things to come. It leads us. It's, it leads us into all truth. And this is what he says in chapter 18, verse 13. Thou shalt be perfect with Jehovah your Elohim. For these nations which thou shalt possess, hearken unto observers of times and unto the diviners. But as for you, Jehovah your Elohim has not suffered you to do this. Jehovah your Elohim will raise up unto you a prophet. If you want to know what I say and what I'm doing and what I'm going to do, I'm going to raise up for you a prophet from the midst of you, your brethren, like me. And if this prophet is like him, what is this prophet going to be speaking for him? Any prophet today that says to the people of Jehovah, you don't have to honor the law of Jehovah is a false prophet. So, well, brother, how can you say that? Well, where, where, are, they, where are they getting the instructions from? And is Jehovah going to tell his prophets to tell his people, you don't have to keep my commandments? That doesn't make sense. They're not going to manipulate. In fact, Jehovah's people say, if a prophet comes to you and say, don't be afraid of that prophet. If they're telling you to go, let's, let's go serve other Elohims. Let's do this. Let's, you know, first of all, his prophet, if you look at the prophets throughout the Old Testament, from Genesis to Malachi and even beyond, after Moses, when the Almighty raised up a prophet, you know why he raised up a prophet? Because his people had departed from his word. The prophet was raised up to call the people to repent and to return. That was their job. Repent, return. He would raise them up and, and they would call the people back. And when the people refused to go back, then he would send 
individuals. So y'all want to leave? Well, we're going to take you into a land far, far away from here. <laughs> Let me see how you're going to do under the servitude of another master speaking languages you don't understand as their slaves in bondage when I promise you if you obey these commands, you never go back in bondage again. The old fallen man is subject to his fallen master, the devil. The new man, the new creation in Messiah is subject to its master, Jehovah. The old man under his master, the devil, is capable of all manner of abominable, corruptive, corruptible, evil, and immoral works. The old fallen man is subject to try and do whatever it gives itself over to. And is not interested in pleasing Jehovah. That is the mindset of the world. Jehovah gave his people his prophets, his word and his prophets, the ultimate prophet Yeshua, the word made flesh to inquire of and warn them not to seek out people of the nations for guidance or direction. There are those in the world who have some religious knowledge that will allow themselves to go so far in the world of immorality, thinking they can control the situations only to realize they have no control as they thought and are taken captive by their situations, rendering them to lie and cover up in order to not be seen as the, dev as the evil that has been allowed to operate in them in darkness. See, the moment you hit that first marijuana, especially if you like it, it won't be your last time. The moment you drink that first glass of beer, that first glass of wine, if you like it, it won't be your last time. Now, at first, it's your choice to do it. But after a while, when it becomes an addiction, you don't have the choice no more. That choice has been taken from you. The moment you give up your virginity, especially if you like it, then you're going to do it some more. And once you give it up, you can't get it back. And now you get into an addiction, a feeling. Because, see, there are certain feelings that once you expose yourself, you want to feel again and again and again. And the more you give over to that feeling, the more that feeling takes over you to where now you are a slave to a feeling. One cannot serve two masters. Don't think for a moment you can give in just a little to evil inclinations without becoming consumed by the evil you give in to just a little. So how do you avoid to being demonized? Just a few steps here. Receive the message of truth. That should be of truth. Receive the message of truth. See, I didn't I didn't develop the little boldness to mess with these PowerPoints again while I'm teaching from them. I decided I could not allow the fear of messing up the PowerPoint keep me from correcting the PowerPoint. Now, y'all might not see this, but I just overcame something. I don't know how you, you know, I was bothered by that when I did it the first time and I lost my PowerPoint. It's like, I'm not doing that again. I'm not doing that again. And it's like, how dare I allow myself to be intimidated by a PowerPoint? No, you got to overcome that. Now, there's a lesson there. Whatever it is that is causing you fear, you got to over overcome it. Whatever it is intimidating you or trying to intimidate you, you got to overcome it. You got to walk in authority and all power, in authority and power in all areas, even, even PowerPoints. <laughs> so receive the message of truth. Repent from wrongdoing and wrong living. If you recognize what you're doing, why is it that you see you do something wrong and for whatever reason you procrastinate to do right? Why? Why don't you just nip that thing in the bud? Maybe it's not as simple as nipping it in the bud. Maybe it nipped you in the bud. And this is where you have to take your authority back. 
Renounce immoral behavior. If, if swear words, curse words, immoral thoughts and behaviors is coming out of you, stop it. Because if you don't stop it, the more you allow these things to occur, remember the devil is watching. See, what he does is he observes you, your behavior, your personality, and then decides how to infiltrate you. Because see, here's what the devil's got to do. The devil has got to make you think that what you're doing is what you want to do. Why would anybody who loves Jehovah want to do something that is not of him? And if you love him to the point to where you know what you're doing is wrong, why won't you stop it? See, what the enemy does is he infiltrates your personality. He infiltrates your likes, your dislikes. And the goal is to become one with you and to cause you to become one with him. To where you can't distinguish or separate your behavior, or your personality from his. This is the same thing the Almighty is trying to do for you and I. He wants you and I to become one with him so that he will become one with us. And so that we become one with, an, one with another. But the enemy tries to manipulate that whole process and cause you to think you love God while you're serving him. He don't have a problem with you coming here. He don't have a problem with you hearing all these messages. He don't have an issue with you downloading all of the, the, the e-books, the podcasts, and watching Arthur Bailey Ministries 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He don't have a problem with you doing none of that. What he do have a problem with you is applying that word. See, now all hell's going to break loose. Yeah, you, you know, I don't have a problem. You know, you got, you, got a, you got the knowledge. That's good. You got the knowledge. Oh, I'm so proud of you. As the devil talking. You know the right stuff. The problem is the doing. You see, to know the truth and not do the truth, you deceive yourself. The devil who is a deceiver don't have to deceive you because you're doing a pretty good job on your own. <laughs> Renounce immoral behavior. Return to Jehovah and live in his truth. Now, if you're going to engage in casting out unclean spirits, and this is the last few slides, for real, you must know the rules of engagement. It's important for you to know the rules. First, distinguish an unclean spirit from carnal nature or a person's normal behavior. Parents, that requires discipline. Casting out unclean spirits is easy. You have to know that. If you're walking in authority, under authority, you tell a spirit to go, it has to go. You must know your authority is in Messiah, not your knowledge. You can read, you can study demonology, you can study all the books, all of them, and there's a lot of them. I've read books on demonology, books on inner healing and deliverance and all of those kinds of things. And you can find the formulas and you can learn the names and you can identify behaviors with certain types of spirits. <laughs> but you better know your authority is in Messiah, not your knowledge. There's seven sons of Siva in Acts who talking about, you know, I assure you in the name of the one whom Paul speaks. It's like, I know Messiah, I know Paul. <laughs> Who you? You better know your authority. The devil only respects, notice this, the devil only respects the law, the word of Jehovah. That's what the devil respects. Remember Yeshua? He was led into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. The devil came and then the devil had to go. Why? Because every, every turn, he quoted the Torah. 
He didn't use Peter. He didn't use Paul. Ignatius, Martin Luther, John Calvin, he didn't use none of them. He quoted the Torah. And the devil said, oh, I see. Okay. You, you, you know a little something, something here. All right, I'll be back. <laughs> That's what he had to do. Why? Because he couldn't hang. So the, the, the devil gets into a lot of these ministries and preachers and try to convince the people of Jehovah through these representatives that they don't have to honor the commandments of Jehovah, not realizing they're coming underneath the devil's authority. And he don't have to go nowhere when you tell him to go. What authority are you operating in? In Jesus' name? In Yeshua's name? I command you in the name of Yeshua. I command you in the name of Jesus. The power is not in the name. The power is in the word. When you start walking in that word, speaking that word, and commanding unclean spirits according to that word, then he has to listen. But you have to be submissive. Submit to Jehovah. Resist the devil. What does the Bible say? Because see, if you are submitted to Jehovah, remember the devil is telling Yeshua, He's saying, you know, all these things, if you bow before me, when you start dealing with satanic witchcraft, demons, they're going to try to talk you out of what you think you know. They're going to try to get you to compromise. They're going to try to appeal to you to back up just a little bit. What if, what if, what if, what if three or four of us left? Will you leave the, would you let the rest of us stay? <laughs> now, you may not have had to deal. I remember one time I was dealing, you know, I know a lot more than I know now. I, I know what I would have done now back then. But I remember somebody was telling me, woman in the basement, she's cutting up. She's, she's, she's letting them spirits loose again. And I go down there because I'm, I'm going down there in the name of Jesus. Sure enough. And, and that spirit started mocking me. Now, I'm fortunate it didn't jump on me. But I said, come out in the name of Jesus. And that spirit said, come out. Come out. Come out, come out, come out. It's like, you know, now what am I going to do? <laughs> and when I look back on that moment, I was operating from here. Why? Because I'd seen his power manifest and I'm operating on that. And I'm reminded of what Yeshua, you know, his disciples, when they came, the Bible says that, you know, a man brought his, his son and they couldn't cast the demon out. Now they had been sent out to cast out demons. They hadn't returned, they hadn't long returned from casting out demons, raising the dead, healing the sick. And now a man brings them an a son with an unclean spirit and they can't come cast him out and he's upset with them. What happened? There's a place where you can operate out of knowledge and not be submitted to authority. You can run and operate in your information. Having the knowledge only makes you big-headed. And the devil don't have to listen to a big-headed preacher. A lot of them big-headed preachers didn't come underneath the devil. Now their ministry don't exist no more. Big names and little names. And it's important that you and I don't become one of them. There's a point where you can operate in your knowledge and not be operating in faith. Faith will keep you submitted 
to the one you put your faith in. You can put your faith in the word or you can put your faith in him who is the word. And what I mean is that there's a difference between having the, just cause you memorize scripture don't mean you're a man of faith or a woman of faith. That means that you're a person who memorized scripture. Unclean spirits leave, but they return. The person, the spirits have been driven out, must submit to the law, word of Jehovah. As I've said before, this is what stopped me from casting out demons before telling people that um, today I focus on teaching and I have to stop. I have gone longer than I've gone in a long time. But, but I think you get the message. You get the message. And the last thing I wanted to give you was Ephesians chapter 6. And I encourage you to read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 15, 16, 17, 18. Read them. I'm going to stop there. Father in heaven, I just thank you. I thank you for your goodness and your mercies. Father, knowing that this message, this, this, this title is so much, is so much that could be communicated. Help your people to realize, to recognize, to operate in the authority and power that you've given them, knowing that when we do that, even the spirits that were subject to Yeshua, like him, would have to be subject to us as well. Help us to recognize the authority, to walk in your truth, to submit to your will, to stay under your covering, always, to be mindful of our behavior, our thoughts, our actions, our intents, completely surrendered that we may walk in the authority and power as Messiah walked in. Help us in Messiah's name. Shalom, saints. Tithing and giving first fruit offerings are critical parts of the believer's faith and has its foundation back in Genesis 4-4 when Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And Jehovah had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Abel was commended by Jehovah in Hebrews 11:4, where it states that by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Solomon said in Proverbs 3, 9 and 10, Honor Jehovah with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall your barns be filled with plenty and your presses shall burst out with new wine. The prophet Malachi wrote in chapter 3, verse 11 and 12, to bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now, he with, says Jehovah of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there should not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, says Jehovah of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith Jehovah of hosts. When we tithe and give offerings consistently in obedience to Jehovah's commandments, we can count on him to keep his promises to us and consistently meet all of our needs. It is our Father's desire to bless you. However, it begins with you and your act of obedience to tithe and give offerings. Do it today. Shalom. For more information, visit www.arthurbaileyministries.com or call 888-899-1479. House of Israel International Services is made possible through financial contributions from brothers and sisters like you. Thank you.